Yes, I'm back. It's Monday, so I'm back. I hope you all had a wonderful Easter weekend. But I'm back as we hear on Beyond Reason Radio, where we talk faith, culture, and politics every Monday and Friday at 8 p.m. If you download the Beyond Reason Radio app, you can listen live. And um, today, we're going to get into a lot of things that are, well, beyond reason, including I might be defending Donald Trump a little bit. Yes, I've been critical of him a lot, but I actually might defend him some. He has a new foreign policy. uh, Well, he was interviewed by the New York Times and gave a lot of foreign policy ideas, and a lot of people are upset about it. But a lot of what Trump says is going to resonate, and it makes sense. Not all of it, though. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen if Trump becomes president and implements some of these ideas. I'm going to tell you. Also, we have uh, Beyond Reason Politics, as I talk about Trump, and Ted Cruz seems to be rising in some of the polls, so we're going to talk about that. And Beyond Reason Obama, a segment today specifically directed towards the beyond reasonness of Obama, whether specifically dealing with his trip to Cuba, which <laughs> oh, everyone thought it was great, except one person, Castro. He didn't think it was so great. That's interesting. And, of course, the B- there's some new uh, news about Obamacare, some new stats about Obamacare. I have been one of the foremost people warning people about Obamacare still. A lot of people seem to be forgetting about it in this election. I'm here to tell you it's still a major issue. So we're going to talk about that. I thank you all for joining me. I am your host, Michael Yaffe, the voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason. Oh, oh and I almost forgot. We can't forget about I will end the show. With stories that were so beyond reason that they left me flabbergasted. I know that's some of your favorite segments. One, Some of you really like that segment. So we're going to talk about some stories out there that left me flabbergasted. Okay, but one thing that is definitely beyond reason. Oh, by the way, if you want to chat with the show, you're listening live, you can chat with the show. Just click the little chat button right there on the app or on the website and chat with the show. And uh, you can give your comments as the show goes on. And I will say them on the air. So Donald Trump, once again, it's, I have to give him credit. He knows how to stay in the spotlight. And I've said this for a while. He is so good at bringing attention onto himself. He really is. And he's doing it again. And what's funny is this came out Right after the whole National Enquirer Ted Cruz thing, Cruz blamed Trump. It seems like the National Enquirer story about Cruz is bogus. And Trump's kind of deflecting away from that a little bit. And he did a big major interview with the New York Times talking about ideas on foreign policy. And some of these ideas are, to a lot of people, pretty radical. But I have to admit... When I hear people like Andrea Mitchell on uh, MSNBC or on NBC News, she was on Meet the Press. She's an NBC commentator, as many of you know. And she just could not believe Trump would come up with these ideas. And this, you know, mostly leftist person. If if she hates it, it's going to kind of make me like it a little bit. But when I read through it, you know, remember, I'm your voice of reason. When I read through some of his ideas, some of it, I thought, well, he's right. But I have some big concerns about some of his things, some of his ideas as well. But instead of just reading through everything, actually, Andrea Mitchell goes over some of it in uh, the MS on uh, Meet the Press on NBC News over the weekend. Of course, she's bashing Trump. And I'm going to have to defend Trump a little bit here. I know a lot of people didn't think I'd be doing that today, but hey, I'm a fair man, I'm a fair guy, and I'm going to have to defend Trump a little bit to uh, Andrea Mitchell, NBC News. This is what she said about some of Trump's foreign policy ideas that he gave to the New York Times. He's all over the lot, and then the New York Times, David Sanger and Maggie Haberman, do an interview with him, a 90-minute interview, and it's in today's paper and online. And the transcript, if you read the transcript online, he would cancel defense treaties with Japan and South Korea against North Korea. He doesn't mind. 
Okay, stop right there. He doesn't want to necessarily cancel those treaties outright. So it's her just saying that, oh, he just wants to cancel them and let North Korea do what it want. No. Trump's whole position is he's okay with us keeping bases in South Korea and Japan against North Korea. He just doesn't want us footing the bill for all of it. Okay, and a lot of people will say, are we footing the bill for all of it? Well, I did some research, as I do before the show, and no, we're not footing the bill for all of it. South Korea does contribute millions of dollars towards uh, the troops and the bases we have there. And Japan, I think, contributes about a billion dollars a year towards bases there. So to say we contribute all of it, no. But there are reports, even though they contribute, we still spend a lot of money on these overseas bases. In fact, in 2013, a couple years ago, the the Associated Press and others came out with an investigation. Actually, it was a year-long investigation by the Senate Armed Services Committee that said that the cost and burden sharing as the United States spends more than $10 billion a year to back up the U.S. military pers- presence overseas, with 70% of the amount expended in three nations, specifically Germany, Japan, and South Korea. So we are footing a lot of the bill. They are not spending as much as maybe they should. And people will say, well, we need to have these bases. And Well, I agree, we do. But maybe not as much of a presence as we had. And what Trump is just merely saying is if they want us to stay there, they need to contribute more. Okay, and but I'm going to get into something with this because when I was reading his whole Trump's whole ideas on foreign policy, everything Trump does here, and he admits this, is through the, vent, the uh, lens of economic bargaining. He's going to change foreign policy by economic bargaining because he feels we're poor, we're out of money, and this is going to be a way to get money back into the country. I'm not sure it's going to work out like Trump thinks it is, though. It doesn't always work like it does in the business world when it comes to foreign policy ideas like this. And I'm going to tell you why in a little bit. But I have to agree, they need to contribute a little bit more. And there was one thing, well, let, let's continue on with what Andrea Mitchell said, lecturing Trump as I have to uh, lecture Andrea Mitchell. He would be okay if Japan and South Korea go nuclear. American policy right. for decades since World War II has been trying to keep nukes out of that, that arena. He... Now, there, Trump did admit that they're going to want to go nuclear because the U.S. is becoming weaker and they're going to want to defend themselves. And instead of being dependent on our nuclear arsenal, Maybe they should have their own if they want it. Now, I mean, that's going to start quite an arms race over there. Is that something we want? Oh, well, maybe. But uh, Andrea Mitchell uh, continues on here. Would stop importing oil from yeah. Saudi Arabia if they don't pay more for their defense. We need oil. We are not in right. energy independent. We rely on oil. It's- All of a sudden, a leftist admits that we rely on oil? Wow, that we need Saudi Arabia's oil? They actually admit it now? That was kind of beyond reason. But the fact is, Trump is right on that. We are not as dependent on Saudi Arabian oil as we once were. We make a lot more of it here because of fracking and new technology, just like Trump said in the interview. And what he's merely stating again, he doesn't necessarily want to stop getting oil from Saudi Arabia. He just wants them to contribute a little bit so we're not paying for everything as we're policing the world. I think that's fair, although Saudi Arabia does contribute. But the fact is, it's it's the leftists in government. It's, it's the green extremists, the global warming extremists, Obama, the EPA, other things that are making it very hard to be energy independent so we could... The whole reason we want to be energy independent is so we can have a bargaining chip against countries like this in the Middle East. So we have to make sure first that we continue fracking and have new technology and drill and get more of our resources here so we can have this bargaining chip. So I can't fault Trump for wanting to do that. 
You Saudi Arabia did it to us in the 70s. Why can't we do it to them? So I think it's just, but it was funny to me that uh, noted leftist all of a sudden admits that we need Saudi Arabia's oil. Um, here, Andrea Mitchell continues. Still, uh, sure. For our daily needs. He is completely all over the lot. On Iran, he he believes, he complained that Iran isn't buying our planes. It had to be pointed out to him that Iran is still under sanctions and cannot buy American planes. He thinks North Korea and Iran are the biggest trading partners when North Korea's biggest trading partner is China. He is completely uneducated about any okay. part of the world. Now, when I read it, I don't think he is completely uneducated about any part of the world. He's not. He obviously knows something. He's traveled the world. I can't believe I'm defending Trump this much, but here it is. And by the way, if you agree or disagree, just chat with the show and send me a message and tell me. But I, he's not. But when I did read some of this, it's in the New York Times. You can go read it for yourself. He is over the lot, all over the lot on a lot of things. He kind of goes all over the place. His stream of consciousness takes him everywhere. That's how Trump is. And sometimes I'm wondering what he's saying. Um, he admits that NATO has become obsolete. Well, I don't think NATO has become obsolete, but I do like his idea of having NATO focus more on fighting terrorism than uh, fighting against the Soviet Union, which, of course, doesn't exist. But... We still need that NATO protection because Russia, even though they're not the Soviet Union, they're still a dangerous, possible dangerous enemy of ours. And those countries rely on us. Some of those smaller countries like Georgia and Poland and Ukraine, they want NATO more involved because Russia's trying to get in on their territory. Who knows what Russia would do if we just totally get rid of NATO? But Trump doesn't want to get rid of it. He just wants to reform it somewhat and actually nato has been a big partner in fighting terrorism already they they do a lot of the fighting they did a lot of the fighting in afghanistan so sometimes i wonder because trump trump says these big things and he often exaggerates because he's a populist that's what populists do and he's the usual politician and he wants to get elected so when i'm reading some of this stuff it's often very exaggerated but he makes some good points. It's exaggerated to say that these countries don't contribute where we have bases. It's exaggerated that, oh, well, we have these huge pr troop presence in Europe. Well, actually, we're already been pulling troops out of Germany. It's already been happening. So Trump saying this, it's not like it's new. It's already kind of happening. But he says, oh, they need, they're not contributing. Well, they are contributing. I mean, a billion dollars a year is nothing to sneeze at. But... There is a point to be made that maybe they should contribute more. And economic bargaining isn't necessarily a bad thing. But here is where this worries me. This is where it really worries me. What's going to happen? Trump is thinking that countries like Japan and South Korea, Germany, European countries, other bases, Saudi Arabia. He is assuming that those countries really want us to stay there. To really want us to still have those bases and troop presence there. And that they will come to the bargaining table to keep us there. I'm not so sure of that. In fact, I was reading a story um, from RT.com earlier about Japan. And they're, having, they're wanting to cut spending to those military bases. It's from last year late last year, 2015, they want to cut spending to some of those military bases in Japan. And in fact, there was protests there that want the U.S. out of there. There's movements in, this con in those countries to get the U.S. presence out of those countries. So this is my prediction. If Trump was able to implement this, all these plans, he's thinking he will get them to the bargaining table. I'm thinking... These countries are just going to say, okay, go, bye. We'll, we'll just do it ourselves. So we won't have that presence that we have there. South Korea might be a different thing. They might come to the bargaining table a little bit. But I don't know. There's movement in all these countries to get rid of the U.S. presence there. So the U.S., the military, will be pulling out of a lot of the world. 
And I know a lot of libertarians out there think that's exactly what we need to do. It's exactly what we need to do. But I warn you, any it will create a vacuum. And a vacuum in the world has to be filled. So if we pull out of Asia, South Korea, Japan, other areas of Asia, that vacuum is going to want to be filled. First, it will start an arms race in those countries, but it will want to be filled by China. China will use that as an opportunity to gain major influence in that area of the world. In Europe, we're going to pull out of countries like Germany fine. Hopefully the European Union can sustain it, but right now they have huge economic problems because they have this whole entitlement state. That vacuum is going to increase the influence of Russia. So what's going to happen is the U.S. pulls out of the world because these countries, they're not going to want to bargain. They're just going to say bye. They're going to think that's better. Bye-bye. You know, U.S., you go and be your own country. So we are going to pull out of the world, which we're already starting to do. It's already happening. It's been happening under Obama. But it's going to happen even more. And what's going to happen is you're going to have the Russian sphere of influence grow substantially. The, the Chinese sphere of influence grow substantially. And Saudi Arabia, you know, just because we pull out of Saudi Arabia and pull out of the bases, Saudi Arabia will just be like, okay, we're just going to buy more military equipment and do it ourselves. So you're going to have a growing, powerful Saudi Arabian army. They're either going to buy from us, or they're going to buy from Russia, or they're going to buy from China. So I'm very concerned about this. I agree that maybe we shouldn't be spending $10 billion a year on this stuff. That we need to negotiate better deals, like Trump says, with these countries. But what I fear is Trump's going to go too strong with this. And Japan's just going to say, oh, okay, bye. We'll take care of ourselves. South Korea is going to say the same thing. Germany's going to say the same thing. The former Soviet Union countries that are now independent in Europe are going to say the same thing. Countries in the Middle East are going to say the same thing. And all of a sudden, the American influence in the world is gone. Now, some people say that's great. But history, I'm just telling you, I know everyone that's going to be like, oh, you're such a neocon. Trying to be a voice of reason here. History shows that every time America creates a vacuum like that, that it could start trouble. So we have to be extremely careful. Now, one thing that really bothers me about this whole thing, though, is Trump says he wants to do this for money, monetary reasons. Because we need the money. We're broke. And this will help us become a rich nation again. We need to better have better opportunities economically, not spending all this money on stuff. Okay. But then I hear Trump say things like this that make me think, do you really understand, Trump, where most of the money is going? I'm all for getting rid of the debt. But if you think negotiating these deals with other countries is going to help pay off our massive debt, your $10 billion is not a lot in terms of our massive debt. You're out of your mind. And the things he really needs to reform, he doesn't want to touch. Like when he said this. I will do everything within my power not to touch Social Security, to leave it the way it is, to make this country rich again, to bring back our jobs, to get rid of deficits, to get rid of waste, fraud, and abuse, which is rampant in this country. Rampant. Totally rampant. And it's my absolute intention to leave Social Security the way it is, not increase the age, and to leave it as is. Uh, you have 22 years. You have a long time to go. It's not long in terms of what we're talking about, but it's still a long time to go. And I want to leave Social Security as is. I want to make our country rich again so we can afford it. I want to bring back our jobs. I want to do things that will make us, that will bring back GDP. That is madness. It's insane. You cannot. This, this is why he can't get the millennial vote. The real biggest problems in our debt, 
massive discretionary spending, which increased with the stimulus and other things. But also, but mainly it's programs like Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. And they're growing exponentially. And they say, oh, 22 years, they were going to run out of money. It's probably going to be sooner than that by some estimates. The unfunded liabilities, the debt that's going to be come from that is massive. People in my generation never really expect to see Social Security because they're not going to have the money by the time I get there. People are living longer, and with new technology coming online, which I've talked about a lot in this show, we're going to be living even longer. I mean, what if the average age really spikes, and you have an average age of 100? Yet Social Security age, what is it, 65 now? 60, yeah, it's 65, I believe, or 66 or 67. And you're not going to raise the age at all? That means... You're going to have 30 years of people on getting, receiving money from Social Security. They, the math doesn't add up. And he said, we're going to get rid of phrase, fraud, waste, and abuse. We're going to pull out of the, you know, stop policing the world. That'll make it up. No, <laughs> that's insane. That's why I'm like, are we serious here? Are you really serious about reining in government spending? He seems like an informed policy, but when I hear stuff like this, he's not serious. And the reason why Trump is saying that about Social Security is because his whole voting block is older voters who are scared about losing their Social Security. And he's pandering to the older vote, which he has been this whole time. And he'll get the older vote, but he won't get the millennial vote. He won't get minority votes. He's doing terrible with women. And I don't think he's serious. So I like part of Trump's foreign policy. But if we honestly think that pulling out of the world, creating powerful countries like Russia and China, even more powerful, is going to solve our economic problems, you're crazy. That's not beginning to address. If we're not going to reform things like Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, Obamacare, other things, discretionary spending, we're... We're crazy. It's beyond reason, as we like to call this show. All right, we're going to get into uh, some beyond reason Obama-ness. I like that, Obama-ness. Beyond reason Obama-ness. Um, we're talking about uh, Obama's trip to Cuba and other things. You are listening to Beyond Reason Radio here at beyondreasonradio.com and the Beyond Reason Radio app. It would be beyond reason not to listen to Yaffe on your tune-in radio app. Download the app today and search Beyond Reason Radio. Are you a small business owner in the Orlando area? Are you looking for a new affordable way to advertise your business? Well, look no further than Beyond Reason Radio. By advertising on Beyond Reason Radio, you use the power of the internet, of radio, and of podcast. Beyond Reason Radio is available on pretty much any podcast outlet you can think of. And that means your advertisement could be on those podcast outlets as well. What better way is there to reach a loyal conservative audience for you on beyond reason radio you get personal advertising by me, Michael Yaffe, the host to reach people who are interested in your business. If you're interested in advertising on Beyond Reason Radio or the website beyondreasonradio.com or the podcast available, like I said, anywhere, all you have to do is go to the Facebook page, like the Facebook page at facebook.com slash beyondreasonradio and send me a message telling me about your business and say you're interested in advertising. Why not help lift your business up today by advertising on Beyond Reason Radio? If you heart Beyond Reason Radio, listen to the Beyond Reason Radio podcast on iHeartRadio. Just download the iHeartRadio app and search Beyond Reason Radio. Welcome back to the show, everyone. This is your voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason. I am your host, Michael Yaffe, as we do this show, Beyond Reason Radio, every Monday and Friday live at 8 p.m. Or you can check the podcast anytime you want, anywhere you want, which in itself is a little beyond reason. Okay, so we have a little bit 
We went over some beyond reason politics. Now we're going to go over some beyond reason Obama. Obama is still in the White House. His policies are still been implemented. And there's some things going on that I warned you about that are beyond reason. Specifically, do you all remember when Obama repeatedly said this? If you've got health care already then you can keep your plan if you are satisfied with it. If you like the plan you have, you can keep it. I intend to keep this promise. If you like your plan and your doctor, you can keep them. You'll be able to keep your health care plan. If you like your plan, you keep your plan. If you like your doctor, you like your plan, you can keep your doctor. You can keep your plan. So, Obama, the whole, one of the big reasons Obamacare was able to pass is he was able to convince people that if you were on employee-based coverage... Nothing would change. Uh, Except that that wasn't true. Many people were losing their plans. Employees had to change. Employers had to change their plans because of all the regulations added on there. But it's getting even worse. According to the CBO, this came out today. uh, They project that millions of workers will leave employer-sponsored health plans over the next decade because of Obamacare. Some will opt to go on Medicaid, but others will be kicked off their company plans by employers who decide not to offer coverage anymore. According to a new CBO report titled Federal Subsidies for Health Insurance Coverage for People Under Age 65. It says, as a result of the Affordable Care Act, between 4 million and 9 million fewer people are projected to have employment-based coverage each year from 2017 through 2026, then would have had such coverage if the ACA had never been enacted. There's the key statement there. If the Obamacare was never enacted, this wouldn't have happened. So much for the promise. Employers now cover some 155 million people, about 57% of those under 65. That's expected to decline to 152 million people in 2019. Ten years from now, employers will be covering about 54% of those under 65. I think it's going to be even worse. I think the I think the CBO is being extremely generous here, but that there you go. This, um, you know, and part of me thinks I would like to get rid of uh, employment-based plans. I would much rather us buy health insurance like we do car insurance on our own. But not through a government exchange subsidy program. If the whole point was to cut costs, then why didn't we address cutting costs? We didn't address cutting costs. We wanted to make sure more and more people were covered, but it's costing more. And trust me when I tell you, because I was on, before I was on my employment-based plan I'm on now, I was on an individual plan through a local health insurance company. It was before Obamacare was ever passed. As soon as Obamacare was passed, the premium went up. The premiums under that insurance company now under Obamacare are much higher. I was a young guy. I bought a high deductible plan, but it also was a PPO, so I had deductibles. It worked for me, and it was before Obamacare was passed, and then eventually I was able to get an employment-based plan. So I understand that we would want people off employment-based plans, but trust me, I've known people going on Obamacare. It's not as easy as it was for me before Obamacare. Instead of addressing the costs and making, getting rid of some of the things that make buying health insurance on your own costs so much, we didn't address that. We created a massive government bureaucracy, a massive government program, massive government exchanges, which more and more insurance companies are opting out of. They can't, they can't stay sustainable. It's not working. Even Democrats are admitting it's not working. And here we are. So we have the fable, the failed promise of Obama. I'm going to get to more Obama beyond reasonness in um, in the next segment. Also, 
don't forget. Don't forget one of your some of your guys' favorite segment, the beyond stories in the news that were so beyond reason that they left me, well, flabbergasted. We'll get to that in a little bit as well. You are listening to Orlando Smart Talk Radio. This is Beyond Reason Radio, and we will be right back. You can now listen to the voice of the millennial generation on Podbean. Download the app or go to beyondreasonradio.podbean.com. Are you a small business owner in the Orlando area? Are you looking for a new affordable way to advertise your business? Well, look no further than Beyond Reason Radio. By advertising on Beyond Reason Radio, you use the power of the internet, of radio, and of podcast. Beyond Reason Radio is available on pretty much any podcast outlet you can think of, and that means your advertisement could be on those podcast outlets as well. What better way is there to reach a loyal, conservative audience for you? On Beyond Reason Radio, you get personal advertising by me, Michael Yaffe, the host, to reach people who are interested in your business. If you're interested in advertising on Beyond Reason Radio or the website beyondreasonradio.com or the podcast available, like I said, anywhere, all you have to do is go to the Facebook page, like the Facebook page at facebook.com slash Beyond Reason Radio and send me a message telling me about your business and say you're interested in advertising. Why not help lift your business up today by advertising on Beyond Reason Radio? You know what's beyond reason? Yaffe is now on YouTube. Go to YouTube now and just search Beyond Reason Radio. Welcome back. It is the conscience in your ear telling you the difference between right and wrong. Welcome back to Beyond Reason Radio as we go over faith, culture, and politics. Remember, you can... uh, Follow me on Twitter and chat with me anytime you want. Just follow me on Twitter at Beyond Reason R. That is Beyond Reason, the letter R. Or you can chat with the show live when we do the show live. Just download the Beyond Reason Radio app. That's all you got to do. Just download the Beyond Reason Radio app and you can chat with the show live when we do the show Monday and Friday at 8 p.m. All right, so I'm going to get into a little bit more uh, uh, Beyond Reason Obama ness out there. But I thought. You know, I was a Ted Cruz supporter, and he's been getting a lot of flack lately. So I thought I'd give you some good news if you are a Ted Cruz supporter. Now, I'm still kind of thinking that Trump's going to win the nomination. It just seems like it's going to go that way. But there are some polls out that show that Cruz seems to be closing the gap on Trump in a lot of upcoming states and a lot of polls. Got this from the American Thinker. It says a suite of new polls suggest that Ted Cruz may be gaining rapidly on Donald Trump in several key upcoming primary contests. In Wisconsin, an Emerson poll conducted March 20, 20th through the 22nd has Cruz leading Trump by 1%, 36 to 35%. A separate poll taken March 19 to 20 by the Washington Free Beacon shows Cruz with a 5% lead over Trump, 36 to 31%. Both are significant improvements for Cruz compared to the previous polling data in late February. Now, let's move on to California. In California, a Los Angeles Times poll from the middle of March puts Cruz now in a statistical tie with Trump. California might get to Trump. 35 to 36 percent with Trump, up from trailing Trump by between 5 and 16 percent earlier in the month. Now, while Trump still leads in Pennsylvania, his margin has shrunk dramatically in recent weeks. A Franklin and Marshall poll conducted March 14th through the 20th shows Trump with just a 3% lead over John Kasich and a 13% lead over Cruz. Back at the start of the month, Trump held a 19% lead over Cruz and a 26% lead over Kasich. So um, lots are changing. I don't know what it is. About Trump, I'm wondering if this whole National Enquirer thing and the whole wives against each other thing is really hurting Trump. Trump is not doing well in the polls with women, and I just really fear him being able to get the youth vote, millennial votes, and that's going to be a huge voting block, whether we like it or not. 
that's what it's going to be. And when I hear Trump, like I said earlier in the show, th- say things that he's not going to even try to reform Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and the debt's just going to keep growing up then. And um, it's all to pander to the older votes. And the millennial votes are just going to tune him out. That He's not addressing them. He's just not. And I don't think he really wants to. So um, there you go. I thought I'd give some of you uh, crew supporters out there, like myself, some hope for the future. Maybe, maybe it's not over. And just like maybe it's not over in the Democrat side because Bernie Sanders was able to get a bunch. He was able to sweep over the weekend in the caucuses and get a bunch of delegates. I mean, can you imagine uh, Bernie Sanders, an old noted Democrat socialist? If we have to choose between him and Trump, it's just, it's uh, mind boggling. It's, it's frustrating. It means we have a lot of work to do. It means young conservatives like you and me have a lot of work to do if we're going to get away from that kind of thinking. Because I believe that Bernie Sanders, by winning these states, I've been saying this for a while, he's starting a movement. Even if Bernie Sanders loses this nomination, which it looks like he probably will, he has started a movement, especially with really young people still in college. Now, there are a lot of young conservatives, a lot of young libertarians as well, that gives me hope. But he is starting a movement of socialism and big, huge, gigantic government with a lot of young people. And it's a movement that people like you and me are going to have to combat in the war of ideas, in the marketplace of ideas, if we're going to want this country to remain successful. And so I'm just trying to give you the big picture here. That's where the future is going. We're going to, the ideological battle and divide is probably just going to grow. Okay, back to some beyond reason Obama-ness out there. Um, you know, Obama recently made a trip uh, to Cuba, and, you know, it just seemed like Cuba, the Castros and Obama were just best friends. Oh, yes. Obama went there. They were high-fiving, holding hands, dancing. Oh, okay, I don't know if you, I don't think he was dancing in Cuba, but he was at their baseball games, and it just... Oh, it, I guess we're just going to be best friends now with Cuba. Obama loves it there. You could tell Obama was mad that the attack in Brussels happened more because it interrupted his trip. But, you know, you know, Obama loves the socialist haven in Cuba. I mean, come on. So there. So what we thought we thought Obama and Castro's were just best friends. But it turns out maybe once again. Obama was uh, a little naive because although the young Castro who's ruling the country now seemed to get along with Obama, the former dictator eh, didn't like the trip so much. Uh, In uh, Cavana, Cuba, as Cubans debate the impact of President Barack Obama's historic trip to the island last week, one prominent figure is lambasting the visit. That figure, of course, is Fidel Castro. Huh. I can't believe that guy's still alive. Is, I mean, is he a zombie? What? How does that guy stay alive? Anyway, in a full-page column titled Brother Obama, Brother Obama, what are they, Brothers in Socialism, published in the Cuban Communist Party newspaper, Grandma, that, Grandma, interesting, the former Cuban president, Rejected Obama's visit and the words of reconciliation. This is what Castro said. We don't need the empire to give us anything. Well, if you've seen how poor your people are in that country, Castro, uh, you do. You kind of do need us to give you stuff. Um, he uh, was upset at some things Obama said. Obama said, it's time for us to look forward to a future together, a future of hope. But Fidel Castro is not so eager in, um, you know, giving, giving that power back. So, you know, he met with Raul. It seemed like everything was so good. And, you know, Fidel Castro is not, not, not so happy. Not so happy with what's going on in 
Cuba, and it's just it's just sad because we were best friends. Oh, I thought we were best friends. Oh, I guess not. It's more beyond reason. Obama-ness for you. When we get back to the show, I'm going to go over some... The beyond reason stories, stories in the news that were so beyond reason that they left me flabbergasted. You are listening to Beyond Reason Radio here, beyondreasonradio.com and the Beyond Reason Radio app. You want to listen to Beyond Reason Radio live on your smartphone? Download the Beyond Reason Radio app now. Available in the Google Play or Apple App Stores. Are you a small business owner in the Orlando area? Are you looking for a new affordable way to advertise your business? Well, look no further than Beyond Reason Radio. By advertising on Beyond Reason Radio, you use the power of the internet, of radio, and of podcast. Beyond Reason Radio is available on pretty much any podcast outlet you can think of and that means your advertisement could be on those podcast outlets as well what better way is there to reach a loyal conservative audience for you on beyond reason radio you get personal advertising by me michael yaffe the host to reach people who are interested in your business if you're interested in advertising on beyond reason radio or the website beyond reason radio.com or the podcast available like i said anywhere all you have to do is go to the facebook page like the facebook page at facebook.com slash beyond reason radio and send me a message telling me about your business and say you're interested in advertising why not help lift your business up today by advertising on beyond reason radio Listen to the latest episodes of Beyond Reason. Download the podcast at Spreaker.com. Welcome back to the show, everyone. I am your voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason. I thank you all for listening to Beyond Reason Radio. And I'm going to get into the best segment of the show, maybe by some people's standards. The stories in the news that were so beyond reason that they left me flabbergasted. But I was happening... I was just doing a little, uh, going through some news stories online just now, and I found this story pretty interesting, because earlier I talked about Trump and how he wants to basically pull out of a lot of the world, have better deals with countries, not have as many troops overseas, and so on and so forth. Well, I just saw a story in the Washington Times headline, U.S. military ability to fight major overseas war in doubt. Hmm. Beneath the positive press the military receives for prepping to mold women into the nation's first female ground warriors this year, there's another story far more basic to war fighting, according to the Washington Times. Some lawmakers are warning that budget cuts, a troop drawdown, and a decade and a half of wars have created spotty combat readiness, overburdened forces, more fatal accidents, and beat up weapons. Can I tell you, this is just going to help Trump's argument. Because what he's going to say is, we need to stop spending money keeping the troops overseas. We're going to keep, we're going to pull them all back here. We're going to invest more in them. You know, it's kind of interesting when I think about it. It just kind of just came to my head. Trump has been campaigning on more military spending, on making, rebuilding the United States military in one breath. But in the next breath, he wants us to pull out of all these countries to uh, save money. So we might save money and then use that money we save to spend more on the military What's going to solve the problem of the debt then? That thought just came to my head. But um, weeks of congressional testimony from top brass on next year's $524 billion defense budget shows that many Army brigade, brigades and Air Force squadrons are less ready. The Marine Corps lacks sufficient aircraft to fully train pilots. And this goes on and on. Some of members in Congress are very worried that we are not ready. Now, I think some of this is kind of overblown. I mean, we still spend tons of money on the military, and they could probably spend their money more wisely. But I just found that interesting because it was in line with Trump 
coming out with his foreign policy plan and then this coming out. So there's going to be there's going to be an interesting backlash between Trump. If Trump gets elected president, there's going to be some interesting backlash between him and the military because the military is not going to like Trump's ideas, especially when they're already complaining that we're not ready to fight overseas wars. They're going to think it's even worse if we just pull out. So what Trump's going to do, remember, this is how he negotiates. He's going to bribe them. He's going to promise billions of dollars. If we pull out these troops and do all these things, he's going to promise billions of new dollars for new equipment and all such things. So it should be interesting. All the while, I still don't know how he's going to solve our debt problem. Because that was part of his argument of saving money on these troops overseas was to help make this country rich again. But you're just going to be shifting money from one area to another. How are we going to solve the debt problem? Maybe somebody else can tell me. Chat with the show. You can follow me at Beyond Reason, the letter. Because I'm torn on this. Because I agree with some stuff that Trump is saying. But you can't have the best of both worlds then. If we're going to cut the military, then we need to do it. But he wants to pull out the military to pay off the debt, but then he wants to spend more here to rebuild the military. I'm all for rebuilding the military. So I'm I'm just very, very concerned. Um, all right, so I'm going to get to... Uh, the stories that were so beyond reason that they left me flabbergasted. And, well, th- <laughs> this story is definitely beyond reason. Apparently, the Pez company does a Easter egg hunt. Kid you not, an Easter egg hunt. It's been, this is their third annual Easter egg hunt. But you won't believe what happened. You won't believe... What happened at this Easter egg hunt? Um, Here is the story from uh, the local news outlet. It's not the kids that were the problem. It was, of course, the parents. Well, good evening, Kevin. This was the third annual Easter egg hunt sponsored by the Pez Company. They knew this was a growing event, but they never dreamed that something that was becoming wildly popular would become so wild. The field adjacent to the Pez Visitor Center was the site of the holiday Easter egg hunt. It was free to the public, and throughout the week leading up to it, it was attracting a lot of attention on the Pez Facebook page. These pictures show how the massive crowd was building. The event was supposed to take place in three stages, broken down into age groups. Youngest kids first, 12-year-olds, the oldest group. But parents didn't pay much attention to procedure. In fact, Reports say a lot of adults didn't stand still. When it came time for like 1030, like the parents just bum rushed that area. So we started talking to folks of, hey, you know, this is supposed to start at a, a, a directed time that we've we've posted. Let's wait. We'll give a whistle. We'll give the signal to start this. And that lasted about a minute. And then folks just rushed the field and yeah. took everything. So when my son left, he had a broken basket and was hysterically crying. The Pez general manager and his staff tried to regain order, but things quickly spiraled out of control. It was like locusts. Just everybody descended and left. It left Pez with a lot of disappointed children. The company then set up a backup plan, giving out free stuff. But for many, the lines were too long and the mood wasn't right. I'm not going to take my kids somewhere where now I feel like you're not putting their safety, you know, in any way, shape, or form. It's unfortunate people left disappointed, and that's certainly never the, the goal with that. It's just, you know, supposed to be a fun, free activity, and, and we did our best. Unfortunately, it just yeah. fell a little short. Wow. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> can we not have an Easter egg hunt that just, where the parents behave? Are we so, it's, it's candy. It's not like there was gold in the Easter eggs. And by the way, there was 9,000 hidden eggs. And the problem was they tried to have it orderly and the parents, and they just went with their kids and these helicopter parents and they're going out and trying to get their candy. It's like, dude, you're trying to be an example for your kids. And it's just candy. 
Now, remember, this isn't even what Easter is all about anyways, but it, <laughs> it's just, I. you want to talk about stories that leave me flabbergasted? I mean, the poor kid had a broken Easter basket and was crying, and it was because of the parents going crazy. Uh, somebody said uh, it was worse. Somebody was at the event. It was worse than being at Walmart on Black Friday. She added, my toddler that was standing with her brothers were shoved into the field and went with the flow. By that time, it didn't matter. I had to yell go to my boys because it was like an angry mob of chaos. This is an Easter egg hunt. What is wrong with people? I mean, <laughs> and what's funny is the Pez, they just gave away stuff at the end. You still got stuff, but people, people were upset because they had to wait. I shouldn't have to wait for my Easter eggs and my Pez. No, it's, I'm entitled to my Pez. My kids are, should get as much as candy as possible. Who cares about the other kids? We are, um, <laughs> we are something else. Stuff like this, uh, makes me, uh, worry about the future. Okay. I got a comment here from, uh, Catherine, who's a big fan of the show. She asked me, where is the billion going to come from to rebuild the military? Uh, that's a good question. I have no idea. <laughs> Where is that? I mean, that's kind of the point I'm trying to make is he wants to rebuild the military, but he doesn't know where the money's going to come from. He just kind of says things like we're going to get rid of waste, fraud and abuse, and that's going to somehow fix everything. And it's going to take a lot more than $1 billion to rebuild the military. I mean, a billion is definitely not enough. I mean, we spend $584 billion a year now. He's going to want to increase it a lot more. So what he's going to try to do, like I said, like I talked about at the beginning of the show, he has this new foreign policy plan where we negotiate with these other countries like South Korea, Japan, uh, Germany, and others, where if they're not going to contribute more to our military being over there, then we're just going to pull, we're going to bring those troops home and let those countries defend themselves. Now, some people think this is a great thing. We shouldn't be doing this anyways. It's not the Cold War anymore. But I'm telling you, once we do that, you're going to have China grow its sphere of influence in Asia. You're going to have Russia grow its sphere of influence in Europe. And Saudi Arabia grow its sphere of influence in the Middle East. Where it's not going to be all sunshine and lollipops when that happens. But he's saying one of the reasons he says we need to do this is to save money. But I just don't buy that he really has any intention of saving money because he doesn't want to reform the things that are really costing us a lot of money, like the entitlements. And if we do save some money, which is very marginal, marginal how much we would save by not having these bases overseas, we're talking maybe $10 billion a year, which is you know a lot of money, but compared to the whole defense budget, it's not that much if we talk about saving that he's just going to want to spend that money other places to rebuild the military which might be a good thing but i just want to know where where's the money going to come from to pay off our debt are you are you wanting to get rid of the troops overseas to help read the build, rebuild the military here or are you just thinking that's going to save us money to pay off the debt. Which one is it, Trump? And he's not really said. So I'm very torn on this because some of his ideas are good. I do think some of these countries overseas should contribute more to their to the military there. Japan should contribute more money to our bases there. Germany should as well. South Korea should as well. I mean, they contribute some, but they should probably contribute more. I and mean, do we need as big of a military print around the world as we used to have? Probably not. Can NATO be reformed to fight terrorism? I think so. Those are great ideas. But I just worry because Trump is so unpredictable. Like he even met an extreme. He's going to try to come to the bargaining table and these countries are just going to say, well, you can leave then. We'll take care of ourselves. That's fine. We don't really want you anymore anyway. And so we're going to pull out of the rest of the world, create a vacuum. And um, then you have the problem of who is going to fill that vacuum I'm, we're gonna have to get a little more because that's gonna, that's my prediction that what's going to happen is 
we're going to end up pulling out of the rest of the world and something possibly bad countries are going to try to fill that vacuum. So I thank you all for listening and chatting with the show. Catherine chatting with the show. We'll have a, you can always chat with the show. If you download the beyond reason radio app, if you like the show, share it with your friends. There's share buttons on every podcast. I post. There's always a share button. Just push the share button. And tell people what you thought of the show. I thank you all for listening. I'll see you guys on Friday. I